This week on Salvage Squad, we've really given them something to get their teeth into. 50 tons of clapped out, rusty and old Centurion tank. Hidden away in a field not far from Luton Airport is the largest private collection of armoured vehicles in the UK. They've all been lovingly restored by tank nut Nick Meads, except one, the Centurion. The task of restoring this massive tank has fallen to the salvage squad. Axel Cleghorn, the strong yet sensitive mechanic who can always be relied on for the subtle approach. <laughs> Jerry Thurston, the classic car obsessive and engine freak. And Claire Barrett, the level-headed steam engineer. The squad get their first look at this week's restoration, and it's a monster. Oh dear. There's, there are three people who look like they're beaten. Before. You look like you're going up against Tyson. Big. Very big. In need of some restoration. Just a little bit. It's, it's 50 tonnes in weight. That's what you're dealing with. Anybody ever put a tank together before? Airfix. Airfix? I did have a model Centurion did when you? I was a kid. I did. That could be Nick, our owner. I'm well, going to give you five minutes to give it the once over. I'm going to go and have a little chat oh, with him. Mate, right. Enjoy yourselves. OK. There you go, Nick. Hey, Lee. How are you going? Nice to meet you. Nick, why have you got a field full of tanks? Well, it's just my business now. I used to be a kind of local butcher and... Uh, what, you now a, a warlord? <laughs> no, <laughs> getting that way. Um, I just fancied a tank one day instead of a classic car. I used to mess around with old cars, but was always fighting the rust and um, just got bored with them. And I saw this tank advertised and I thought, what a lot you get for your money. And then, so you're the butcher with the self-propelled gun? Yeah, and then someone <laughs> tried to hire it off me for the day and they paid me basically half what I'd paid for it for the day. Nick now earns his bacon running tank driving courses and hires his tanks out for film work. He's even flogged two of them to Steven Spielberg. Got a Centurion here. When did it come out of the army then? Um, I've had her about four years. It was a sort of a mistake really. I didn't know much about Centurions and I thought I'd have one anyway. It was an MOD sale and um, it's a bit of a big white elephant. Can I ask how much? Or do you uh, want to keep that quiet? No, it was three or four grand, I think. I've had it a long while, but um, it's an old beauty. When you say old, how old are we talking? That would be made early 50s. It actually saw service in the Gulf War, and they called it the Antique Roadshow. <laughs> that yeah. tank was in that the Gulf War? That was in the Gulf War, yeah. Hang on a minute, so 50s, now I'm 40 years old? Well, it's a special kind of tank. There's probably only four or five left in the world now. The Centurion is a thoroughbred amongst tanks. During the Second World War, the lightly armoured British tanks were no match for the German Panzers. Tank commanders were desperate for a heavily armoured tank with a decent gun. Eventually, the British came up with the Centurion, just as the war ended. It first saw action during the Korean War in 1950. It may have been late, but the Centurion was just what the tank commanders wanted. The Centurion last saw action in the Gulf War in 1991. As a tribute to over 40 years of service, Nick wants to restore our tank to its Gulf War condition. So you're looking to get it back up to the, the Gulf yeah, War spec? Yeah, so I want it to Gulf War spec. 10 years ago. What do you think about the salvage squad, though? Do you think they've got a chance? They're uh, pouring over it as we speak. I think they have picked the hardest tank possibly in the world to do, and I have spent hours and hours, and I'm still going down in on it. Everyone wants to see the old girl running again but no one's kind of rolling their sleeves up, apart from you fools, people. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's just do a walk around. Then. The squad's first task is to find out what's wrong with the tank. Tracks, mate. Wheels, tracks. Paintwork. Uh, engine. But look at the size of it. I, mean, I know, it's huge. It's monstrous. They divide the tank into three main areas. The turret and the main gun, the engine, which sits behind the turret, and finally, the tracks and wheels. Have we got all the parts to actually fix all this? No idea. That's friend, Jerry. Friend, this is Nick. He owns, he owns the beast. <laughs> right. Axel, you've got your red book there. Yes. yes, I have, mate. Have you made copious notes? Yes. That well-known gladiator. What's wrong with it? Obviously, it needs a clean. Yeah. You know that. <laughs> a bit of gardening, because I saw there's <laughs> yeah, a forest up there. <laughs> what else we got? Um, cut, yeah, all these cupboards, this stuff has to be come up. I mean, how far, what kind of like level are we looking at? Well, we've got to do it good. So we've got to get all that paint off? 
anything that's loose has got to be seriously scratched off. There's it just needs. Other there's a, there's a tracks. load of things. A centurion is trouble. So right, we've got tracks, we've got wheels. The squad have jotted down a list of tasks needed to bring the beast back to life. It's a truly mammoth task, and Nick wants it all complete in time for one of Britain's biggest military shows. We've got about what was we saying about a couple of weeks? Two weeks, yeah. Hold on, let's do it. Here. Okay. Oh my life! There's no time to waste, so the squad hit their number one priority, the engine. If that doesn't run, the tank's going nowhere. The salvage squad are working hard to restore a 50-year-old Centurion tank. Jerry's passion is restoring classic cars. He's tinkered with many engines in his time, but he's never seen anything like this. He's face to face with one of Britain's most historic engines. The tank's engine is a Meteor, a version of the legendary Merlin engine that powered the Spitfire. The development of the Merlin by Rolls-Royce was crucial in giving Spitfires the edge over German fighter aircraft. So when the designers of the Centurion were looking for a powerful yet compact engine, the Merlin was the obvious choice. 24 litres of V12X aircraft engine. That's why I'm here to play with this. I mean, it's just sheer blessed joy. Hear this roar, I'll be a happy boy. It may be historic, but this engine hasn't run in over four years. To make sure it's even safe to start, Jerry gives it a detailed inspection. He checks the fuel lines for blockages and makes sure the electrics are clean and dry. With a bit of luck, that's all the engine will need to bring it back to life. While Jerry gets stuck in, I start my quest to find out more about the tank's history. Nick, has it got a, a name or a number? It has got a registration. It's 01ZR15. 01ZR15. Yeah. ZR denotes its year. I'm bound to forget that. You're going to have to write that down for me. But if yep. you do, I'll take that away with me and see if I can find out any of the... I was going to say former owners, but it'd be former drivers, yeah. wouldn't it, of it, I suppose, former crew. Yeah, now, I've tried to do that and I haven't had much success. I'd love to meet some people who, um, who drove it and, and served on it and everything else. It'd be well interesting. And if any tank that I've got is going to have it, it's going to be this one, because it is so old, it's seen so much service. Claire, do you know what buttons to press? Yeah, I'm here. The question is, has the engine seen too much service to ever run again? It's not having it, is it? It's, it's spluttering, yeah. but if that was going to go, that would have gone. Right. Do you see you what I mean? Do not want to try it once more? Yes, yeah, spin it once more, to, one more time. But I don't want to wet it up, though. Yeah, don't worry. Nah. It's dead. Dead. Jerry starts trying to hunt down the problem. The battery's obviously OK because the engine's turning. Petrol is getting through, so Jerry reckons the problem must be with the engine's 50-year-old electrics. You need two things to start a petrol engine. Firstly, just the right mix of petrol and air squirted into the engine. Secondly, you need a great big spark to light the petrol. But the Meteor's antiquated electrics don't produce a big enough spark to start the engine. Jerry's had an ingenious idea to replace the old electrics with a modern electronic ignition from a Jaguar sports car. Do you know what my instant thought is? What's that? Another V12. Jaguar? Well, yeah. Jerry starts by removing the old electrics from the engine. The old system is called a magneto. The magneto is a mechanical device that needs to spin fast to generate the sparks. The problem is, at start-up, the massive Meteor engine turns over very slowly and the magneto doesn't spark. Jerry's modern electronic ignition gives a good spark, whatever the engine speed. The beauty of it is, is no matter how slowly the spark system is turning, it develops the same big whack of electricity. So I've rigged this little kit up here with essentially what is the ignition system from a Jaguar with its battery, with the electronics box, with a coil, and if you imagine this here, is the spark plug within the engine. No matter how slowly I move this across, you can even hear the spark banging into the cylinder. And that's almost certain to fire our tank engine, hopefully first time. 
it's a brilliant idea in theory, but Bright Spark Jerry now has to work out how to cram the electronic ignition into the casing of the old magneto. While the squad were battling to get the Centurion ready for the show, my mission was to track down a tank's history and trace some of the men who had served in it. Armed with the tank's serial number, I went to visit tank historian Simon Dunstan. Now Simon, we've got a Centurion tank that we're trying to put back together. It's in a pretty rusty state mm -hmm. at the moment and it's, um, I've, I was giving it on a little bit of paper, 01ZR15 and I wondered if you could uh, Tell us a bit more about it. Sure, we've done a bit of research and what we found so far is that it was built in March 1950, or well, that was the date it came into service. So it could have gone to the Korean War. Later, it would have been modified into Mark V. Now, Mark Vs were used in Sueys. In 1956, the Egyptians decided the Suez Canal, which ran through their country, should belong to them. Britain and France thought otherwise. And in what is seen as a last gasp of empire, troops were sent in to try and regain control of the canal. So there you have them landing during the early days of the invasion. Yeah. So what are we looking for? We're looking for 01ZR. One five. So you might actually have the right. Then we got O two Z R. So we're getting in the same area. Hang on. What do we got here? Well, initially it's a horse and car at the front. <laughs> but yeah, there you go. You got O one Z R one five. Oh my God! There it is. Using Simon's amazing collection of photos, we'd established that our tank had definitely served in the Suez conflict. The research was going well. Meanwhile, Jerry finishes his electronic wizardry. All he has to do now is fit it back onto the engine. It's just a pig to get underneath it, isn't it? The magneto is attached to the back of the engine. Yeah. Now. Jerry and Axel are working blind. Now I can reach the bolts my side. Yeah. Can you see that bolt there? Yeah? Where? Just there, where my finger is, yes? That's a... He's fitting the magneto, but there's some nuts he can't reach from his side. So I had to loosen up some nuts, tighten them up from this side. But it's very cramped working conditions. Yeah. A big old jerry in a little hole, it doesn't really work. <sighs> I'm certainly intimate with this engine now. Can you see that bolt there? Can you... Uh... Yeah, Can you deal with that? There you go, done. Oh, good lad. That's it. Well done. Oh. The electrics are on, but will they work? You yeah. ready, Claire? Yeah, I'm in. That's it. Axel pumps petrol into the engine. That's it. Lovely. Happy. Right, ready? Here we go. Leave it. No! She don't want to go. No, she don't want to go. It seems that the problem with the engine isn't the electrics after all. Nick, the tank's owner, is worried. We're taking it to a show, it's got to be totally reliable. At this show you're going to have lots of people there with shiny vehicles and, oh, it'd be embarrassing. It'd be worse than embarrassing. I'm sure I can find a way of sorting it. Yeah. Luckily, Claire spots the problem. Are you sure you've got all the bits, Jerry? Put that in, have I? Silly beggar. Jerry's been a bit too clever. Modern cars' electrics run on 12 volt batteries, but this 50 year old monster runs on 24 volts. So, what did you forget, Jerry? Oh, sorry, yeah, the voltage converter, because it's 24 volt right, system. Okay. Uh, normal cars are 12. Yes. This is 24. Right. Jerry's forgotten to plug in the voltage converter. Red. So, can Jerry's clever electrics coax this cantankerous old engine back to life? <laughs> Keep it running! <laughs> Woo -hoo -hoo! I want one in my car! That's a sound I haven't heard for a little while. 
The mighty meteor engine has roared and the tank is beginning to come alive. Sounds well, very nice, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, excellent. Claire and Axel now start work on the innards of the beast. Good God, look at this breach on that. See if anything works, Claire. Hey, look. The tank's turret still moves perfectly. Yes, nice one, Claire. Its gun was permanently deactivated when it left the army. And the sad thing is, we're not really allowed to get it going again. It's a fantastic thing. The turret is the nerve centre of the tank's operations. The Centurion would have gone into battle with four men crammed inside. The tank commander sits at the top of the turret. It's his job to navigate the tank and direct the firing of the gun. Tank echoed 400 men. The gun is operated by two men. The gunner who aims the weapon... 400 seconds. ..and the loader. The driver sits in front of the turret. The tank also held ammunition, maps, navigational equipment, a two-way radio, as well as food and clothing for all the crew. All this clobber was stored in metal bin boxes that cover the inside walls of the tank. The bin boxes are going to have to come out, so Axel takes a few snaps with his digital camera to make sure he remembers how it all fits back together. Right, Claire, we better start dismantling the inside of this baby. Well, we're going to give it a fresh look of paint, yeah? Yes, definitely. So if we get rid of... That's, that's coming yeah, out. Yeah, definitely, that's coming out. So anything we can't paint round or under... We remove. It's bad enough with just two of us in here trying to work. Can you imagine what it was like with, you know, driver, commander, gunner, the loader, yeah. everything. I don't even think about it, mate. Like, make love, not war. <laughs> You'd have a job in here. <laughs> Claire and Axel start gutting the inside of the tank, but I'm more worried about what's going on outside. There's supposed to be a bulldozer blade going onto the front of the tank, and there's definitely something odd about that gun. I need some answers. I know it's it, it, with the others as well, and from this, I know it's head on, but this has yeah. got, you know, a very long barrel like my little toy tanks I had when I was a kid. Yeah. And the one we have, um, Nick said it was uh, an AVRI, A V R E, but he didn't know what it meant. Right. Well, AVRI stands for Armoured Vehicle Royal Engineers. Now, I think I might have a handbook here on that very vehicle. We have. Tank Avery 165mm. Now that was the demolition gun which was put on the front. So let's see if this we is can. This a short, stubby one. Yeah, let's see if we can show you that. Now is that more like it? That is definitely more like it, yeah. Now these were actually used as assault vehicles. They had various tasks because they have this thing on the front, the short, stubby gun you were saying, the 165mm demolition gun, which could be used for destroying pillboxes, for attacking bridges. It also has a dozer blade on the front. At the side at the moment. The other side. <laughs> just, just lying there. Right, right. The so that's also used during these assault operations to fill in anti tank ditches, to prepare crossing points across rivers. After starting out its life as a main battle tank, our tank was one of 40 centurions converted into a kind of armoured bulldozer, which the Royal Engineers used to breach enemy defences. Now, they were being converted from stand standard gun tanks, I suggest, during the 1960s. And it carried on until it seems it's gone into the Gulf War. So there you have a tank which was essentially built in 1950, which was still in combat 50 years later. Now, that is a remarkable testament to a superb tank. It's not a bad effort, is it, really? It's absolutely remarkable. It turns out that our Centurion has the longest service record of any tank in the British Army. With such a long history, I was hopeful I could track down someone who'd served in it. Maybe Simon could give me a lead. We have here... So your photograph shows the disposition of where all the tanks were. Let's have a look. 02ZR8, 02ZR6... Oh, look, yeah. 01ZR15. That would be 9 Troop, C Squadron, 6th Royal Tank Regiment. And you can see also who was in the crew. Gunner, as yeah. Horsley... And it's either the driver or the loader would have been Turner. So, well, that's something you could pursue. See if you can try and find the crews. 
Back at the grubby end of the operation, the squad have successfully started the tank's engine, but they're not going anywhere until they fix the tracks and wheels. The tank track is an ingenious invention. Each track is powered by a sprocket connected to the engine. The tank is in effect laying its own road, which the tank's wheels run on. The Centurion's tracks are made up from 112 separate links, each link connected to the next one with a steel pin. But two are missing. Well, hopefully, I'm going to put these back in. Problem being is it is so tight that they may not fit. Hmm, why? Well, the easy bit's the first ones. Yeah. Right, right in. Just twist it, Jeff. That's okay. it. The first link goes in with no problems. <sighs> Time to get stuck by these two teeth. Yeah. But the second one is proving a bit more of a challenge. No, 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 no it ain't going to work this way. Right, new plan. We haven't got enough clearance here, Joe. Right. I Can think we're going to have. I think. Ready? Yeah. We'll put this one on first. Yeah. Because then it gives. The last link has to be fixed at both ends. There's only one way the complex shapes will interlock to complete the track. It's a bit like a Rubik's Cube, isn't it? Yeah. You can. Right, OK. Whichever way they try, it just won't fit. This is getting in between these two. Finally, Axel applies a bit of welly. He manages to get just enough clearance to let the last link slot into place. Yeah, got it. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. you. Yeah. You're the man. Oh, well done, Axel. The last pin is driven in. That's it. Ah. To Jerry. Yeah, I'm fine. Go on. Go, 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 go. Little. Yes, well done, man. That's it. Job done. Excellent. Now we have traction, we can move. I've unearthed a list of crew members who served on the tank during the Suez Crisis and plan to track them down. Meanwhile, the squad face a gruelling four-day campaign to remove all the rust and repaint the tank in desert colours. Hey, oh, I've got another bit for you. Here, Axel. Oh, I've, got, I've got another bit for you. Yeah, but I ain't getting you. on. I oh, know, it's a killer, isn't it? I mean, isn't there no quicker way of doing this? It does take a little while, doesn't it? The salvage squad have just eight days left on their restoration of a 50-year-old Centurion tank. The main weapon the squad have in their battle with the rust is a nail gun. The steel rods or nails knock off any loose paint or rust. It's a noisy and mind-numbing task. Nick takes pity on the squad and gives them a hand. He also confesses his obsession with all things military. Is there a medical term for your condition? Tankulicus or something? <laughs> I'm not the only one, mate. There's loads of tanky people out there. Well, I used to look at them as anoraks, right? And I thought, well, if I get myself a military vehicle, I won't dress in army gear. But really, it's cheap. You get a pair of trousers for 50p, don't you? That's your excuse. I mean, Einstein used to have six brown suits, and that way he didn't have to waste time deciding what he was going to wear in the morning. I'd buy 30 pairs of green trousers, 50 T-shirts, even got pants. <laughs> pants are 10 pence. <laughs> my wife loves them. I'm not showing you my pants. No, please, no, don't, don't show me your pants. I'm sure they're lovely. They're khaki. a mysterious khaki colour in case you get scared in battle. <laughs> they think of everything the MOD. While Jerry was getting to grips with Nick's pants, I was still on the trail of the Suez tank crew. I've contacted the Veterans Association and they've put me in touch with Hugh Leach, who was in C Squadron at the time of Suez, and I'm hoping he can tell us a little bit more about our tank. Hugh, I've got a photograph here of a Centurion, which we believe is in Suez. This is actually our Centurion that we've got. We can just about make out the, the number there. Mm -hmm. If you can look at that, 01ZR. One five, right? 
This is uh, we believe this is your squadron in Suez. I recognise, I recognise the commander instantly. That's um, that's Sergeant Lumsden. But my guess is it's taken a good week or more after the landing because I say Egyptians wouldn't be walking it, around. It looks a lot uh, more relaxed then. Yeah, it looks, it looks much much more relaxed. I have an album, and that tank of yours actually, I think, has a brief mention um if i can find here we are half an hour later at 0715 hours the little column was on the move led by nine troop with sergeant lumsden commanding the leading tank your tank was leading actually the led led of course with the marines yes with what you command actually actually led the invasion <laughs> This was the chaotic state of affairs in Port Said Harbour when Allied forces entered on the scene. Hughes' tank squadron led the ill-fated invasion of Port Said at the mouth of the Suez Canal. Tanks had been ashore for some hours and were engaged in dealing with pockets of resistance. By the end of the first day, British and French forces were in control of the town. However, just before midnight, the UN ordered a ceasefire. Overall, 22 British soldiers and over 900 Egyptians were killed in the fighting. The UN decided the action was unacceptable and the troops would have to withdraw. A military success ended in a political fiasco. I mean, this is actually a map, you know, we drew up before we landed, of course. Right. It was 0715 hours, wasn't it? Yep. it was a great moment of glory of your attacking. <laughs> My guess is it was about there and then it, it would have led the advance probably along Muhammad Ali, Sharia Muhammad Ali, um, until they got to the gas works, which was there, which I think they reached about midday. I mean, was the was the fighting quite heavy? Because that's about four yes. to five hours. Yes, it was. It was, it was, yeah. You had to go very slowly because there was all the sniping. From, from both sides of the... Uh, but from both sides and, of course, from upper storey windows. Yeah. And street, street clearing is a very, very slow process. Was it mostly small arms? Mostly or, small arms. Yeah. And I think the odd grenade. The squad's efforts now turn to the next chapter in the tank's history, the Gulf War. On the 2nd of August 1990, Iraqi forces invaded the oil-rich state of Kuwait. The United States amassed an army from 39 countries around the world to repel the Iraqis. Of the 3,000 tanks used in the operation, our centurion must surely have been the oldest. It was used by the Royal Engineers to breach the formidable Iraqi defences along the Kuwaiti border. To protect it from modern weaponry, the 40-year-old tank was fitted with an additional layer of top-secret reactive armour. I've got some photos in the back of this. Should give us some idea on what the armour looked like. Now, they only sent 12 or 13 of these Avrys out to the Gulf, and they were a siege tank, probably intended to take Baghdad. What does it actually do, the active well, armour? it gives you a second chance. If you got hit by some sort of powerful anti-tank weapon, there's a chance it would damage the armour and the tank would survive, and you could replace the panel of armour mm -hmm. and get away with it. When our Centurion was built, it relied simply on the thickness of its steel plate for protection. But by the 1970s, a new and far more deadly weapon started to emerge. These armour-piercing weapons have become increasingly sophisticated and can now be launched by a single soldier at a distance of three miles. Reactive armour has been designed to give some protection from these ruthlessly efficient weapons. The tip of the shell contains a specially shaped high-explosive charge that forms a jet of incredibly high temperature metal that can bore through virtually any thickness of armour. The reactive armour explodes when hit by one of these shells, deflecting the deadly armour-piercing jet. The army have a policy of not selling its top secret armour to ex-butchers, so Claire is going to have to make a replica. All she has to go on are some old photos and a tape measure. The replica armour will be made from three-quarter inch steel plate, which can't be cut in the middle of a field. 
so Claire cuts out a cardboard version of the armour as a pattern for a local engineering firm. The armour must fit like a second skin around the complex shapes of the turret. If Claire's measurements are out by more than a few millimetres, it won't fit. While Claire gets stuck into some precision engineering, Axel decides it's time to get physical and fits the bulldozer blade. Where do I see that massive crowbar? The blade has to be fitted to six hydraulic arms. Thick steel pins hold the dozer blade in place. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, it looks the part, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, it's smashing. Nice one, mate. The bulldozer blade is on. Claire's taken her template and drawings to a local engineering firm to get them made up in thick steel plate. Finally, Jerry washes down the tank to get it ready for painting the next day. Day 10 of the restoration, and the squad are still wrestling with the rust. Now about the futility of war, the futility of rubbing down bits of tank. You know what this is, don't you? That it's rust. It's the document case, the map case from yeah. the back. No maps in it. Well, some, some rubbish. This is a letter. This is P. Foster. HM Forces Gulf War. This is your actual Gulf War letter? Yeah. Yeah. It's from Captain Foster to Mrs. Foster. Six Troop, 32 Army Engineering Regiment, and it's got a, one of their funny postcodes on it. <laughs> That's your man, isn't it? That's your That's man. That's the man who knows that tank inside out, I bet. <laughs> what, you got it on falling over it? Letter found in the tank. No, to yeah. To Mrs. Foster, HMF Forces Golf. No. <laughs> oh, you, 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 you didn't read it, did you? No. Right. No. What do you well, think we should do with this then? You got some information. We've got a name. And it's the yep. Gulf War, so it's just leading on the story from, on from the photographs you found. Superb. Uh, I'll see you later. I was off to track down Corporal Foster. Meanwhile, Claire's armour returns from the machine shop. We've got this. Uh, construction back from the machine shop, which they've made from my terrible cardboard patterns. And uh, we're just going to see if it fits. The colossal suit of armour has been tailor-made for the tank. The armour, which weighs as much as a small family car, has been designed to fit the tank precisely. An error of just a few millimetres, and we've got problems. We don't want to scratch the paintwork. No. I'll go that way a little bit. Ooh. I think it looks marvellous. It's not bad. It's not but bad then I'm all. bound to say that. She's knocked a bit on the bin at the back there. The other side is exactly the same as this side, isn't it, where it's catchy? Yeah. yeah. yeah? Beautifully symmetrically wrong. <laughs> <laughs> not wrong, just generous. Yeah. We'll take it back to the machine shop and take that little extra back off and uh, give her a lick of paint. Claire puts a brave face on it, but the squad are now falling badly behind. With only two days to go, the replica armour is taken back to the machine shop. This time, there can be no mistakes. Claire goes through the changes with Julian, the machinist. It was a good fit. Well, it looks nice. It's it was a good fit. Just a couple of things. Just a okay. couple of things. This edge here, it clipped the bin boxes on the sides. Gotcha. So I didn't quite get that right. As the armour gets a few final adjustments, Jerry paints the last of the bin boxes. It's now time to refit them all back in the turret. So that's we have to be drawing on it. Look, look, look. Why don't you get in the tank? All right. Crank up your computer, and right. I'll just chuck bits in at random to you. You chuck bits in yeah. at random, okay? Here you go, Axel. First Thank you, Claire. All right. Axel took loads of digital pictures of the inside of the tank. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to look at what his first box is coming up. They're now downloaded onto his laptop. He reckons this will show him exactly where all the boxes go. Claire has her doubts. Three boxes and a long bit at the end, yeah. Excellent. You're going to be all right there. Goes next to it there. 
After eight days of removing rust, Jerry sprays 25 gallons of the Army's finest sand-coloured paint all over the tank. Come on, Axel, just get one more bit. It's in. Only about 6,000 pieces to go. Claire, I haven't got any more room. Honestly. Wait, what about this bit? That bit is nowhere to be seen. How can you lose a bit that big? On the last day of the restoration, I returned to see what the squad were up to. With just a few hours left, the armour is back from the machine shop. Here we go. Excellent. That yeah. With the light beginning to fade, the replica armour is manoeuvred into position. Right, are you ready? Yeah. Right, a little bit more. If it doesn't fit this time, the squad will never make it to the show. That do. It fits. The tank has been transformed. Claire's replica armour looks just like the real thing, and most importantly, it fits. With time now running out, the squad rush to fit all the last bits and pieces. A new driver's seat, four periscopes to give the commander all-round visibility. Pickaxes, a smoke discharger, a crowbar, one last spray of paint and a machine gun. So the tank is finally ready for the show, but there's one last thing to test out. Is it a runner? Nick sparks up the mighty Meteor engine. Guided by Claire, Nick reverses the lumbering beast onto the test track. Now that's hey, a neutral, neutral turn. turn. The tank's going well, and the squad are itching for a drive. 27 litres of full four. Nick wants to find out if any of the squad are good enough to drive the tank during the show. Time for a competition. That is Look at scary. That. Claire draws the short straw and gets the first run. Into gear? Yes. I'm doing this for women drivers everywhere. Not that much. No, no, no. Yeah, that way, that way, that way. That way, that way. Yeah, no, slow down, slow down. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, oh. Well, you stalled it. <laughs> Wait. No, she's gone. All right, never mind. What have you got to do? Put your foot on the clutch. Claire stalls, but soon gets the beast back under control. With its heavy manual gearbox and no power steering, the Iron Giant must be wrestled around the course. Next up, Jerry. I can't get in. No, I really can't get in. I can't, I can't bend. Yes, no, I think that's a refusal at the first gate. All right. I'll have a go. Finally, it's Axel's turn. Now, that's it, lovely. Just keep it like that, chugging along well. I hitch a ride in the commander's seat. Axel's going well, but he can't get it out of second gear, and he's still nowhere near the tank's top speed of 22 miles per hour. A faultless round. Surely something to do with my directions. I knew you'd do it. Yes. <laughs> Good drive, man. Good drive. Military Odyssey 2001. And it's very odd indeed. <laughs> Hundreds of people have come to the Kent County showground to reenact 2,000 years of military history. Our tank has been entered into the competition for best allied heavy armour. Nick's called away to do the commentary for the show while the squad get busy preparing the tank for the judges. I haven't actually told the squad yet, but I've had a bit of a result tracking down Mark Foster, the guy who wrote the letter that Claire found in the tank. I tried contacting Mark using the address on the letter, but he was no longer in the army. However, an old mate from his regiment gave me some leads and I finally tracked him down working for a bank in the West Country. 
Mark hasn't seen the tank for 10 years, so I asked him to come along to the show to reunite him with an old friend. Hi, mate. Hi. Remember the letter? Oh, yeah. yeah, this is the this man. Is nice to meet you, mate. Hey, hey, right. We've got here right. Jerry, Hi. Axel, and Claire. And so so behind us. Behind us is a yeah, tank. Somebody you might recognise. <laughs> I mean, is it, is it anywhere? Have we got it near Spot enough? Spot on, I would say. Spot on. Yeah. 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 The salvage squad have spent two weeks restoring a rusting 50-year-old Centurion tank in time for one of Britain's biggest military shows. Mark hasn't seen the tank for 10 years, so I asked him to come along to the show to reunite him with an old friend. It's, it's exactly as it was, apart from all the gubbins that we used to have, and you know, the... Just like, is that your personal yeah. gear now? And, uh... Actually, talking of which, personal gear, I believe <laughs> that is yours. <laughs> That's how you trace me. That's yeah. how we find so it. We found it. <laughs> you left it behind in, in the map box. box. It's there. Do you want a stamp? Yes. I'll post it on the way out if you want. <laughs> you haven't read it, have you? I haven't read it. <laughs> I haven't read it. I haven't read it. You're but, rather uh, emotional, you know. I'm, I, didn't, I didn't read it, mate. Did you, did you actually write it in the tank? Yeah. 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 We actually met a guy who was in the same troop that this was in. Really? In, in Suez in 1956, and it kind of, for, for a brief spell, it actually led the way yeah. in the Suez campaign. Well, this yeah. was the first tank off at Al Jabail as well in the Gulf. Really? Yeah. 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 So it's, it's, done its, it's done its job then over the yeah, years, hasn't it's, it? Yeah, it's, it's done really well. And as I say, it went all the way up from the border through to Iraq. I mean, how much confidence can you have in a 40-year-old tank that you was in at the time? You'd be surprised, actually, in support of the American forces. Right. And they're in their multi-million dollar tanks and it's stuck in the sand and this whole thing's chugging away. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> a bit like the tortoise and the hare. Absolutely. Did yeah. they take the because you were in a 40-year-old tank? They did originally when they used to see us chugging away, but of course, you know, because they've got automatic transmissions and all computerised systems and all that, and here we are, <laughs> pulling away. And, see you, lads. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> So everybody's looking at us and, you know, we're the first in, and then all the Americans come charging through. So if, you're, if you're first in then, are you, like, <laughs> you're <laughs> taking, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, man, when you're yeah. saying looking at you, you yeah. mean like, looking at you. Like <laughs> that, you know. Well, that's yeah. very pleasant, isn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely, yeah. So, oh, uh, you know, you're number one, and then all of a sudden, as I say, the Americans came through and... Brought up the, the rear, per rear usual. <laughs> Took the glory, <laughs> shall we say. Took the glory. And listen, I, I don't mean to be rude here, Mark, right. but uh, there's a prize being awarded for the best vehicle here today. Right. And uh, it's about 2.30 and we're just coming up for it now. Yeah. So okay. do you fancy commanding us all the way over Absolutely, there? Absolutely, yeah. Excellent. Yeah? If Excellent. I can remember how. The tank is competing against two armoured personnel carriers, an Abbott self-propelled gun and a couple of small Stuart reconnaissance tanks. With Axel at the controls, the Centurion lurches into action. During the Gulf War, the tank was not only the first in across the minefields, but also the last out clearing up the carnage left by the conflict. Mark left the army on the day the Gulf War ended. It was very strange finding that letter of yours. Yeah. Very strange. I remember the day I wrote it. Loads of rockets going off over our heads. <laughs> And you actually, I mean, your handwriting's not bad, but you actually sat down and wrote a letter. We were moving at the time. <laughs> I think that's, this will now be the last move we'll make before anything will happen. We picked up a couple of supplies like bread and a couple of drinking mugs. When we asked how much, he just let us have them. So we gave his children some chocolate and sweets. You should have seen the, the kids, they thought it was Christmas. I hope you're well, thinking about you all the time. Hopefully we'll all be back together. Long time ago. Do 
just takes you back, you know, and you, <clears throat> just the smell of it reminded me of it again all those years ago. Do you think it was the right thing to do to restore the tank? Yes, I do. Yeah. And I think a lot of people have given, a, you know, a, a lot of their life, lifetime to it. Um, no, it's, it's gone through too much to just lock up and put away. I'm really pleased you said that. <laughs> we were dreading you turning up and going, actually, you should have just sold it for scrap. No. <laughs> no. Thank no. you. Well played, mate. Cheers. Go on. Yeah. Can I get in just two weeks, the squad have resurrected the tank's engine with a modern electronic ignition, restored the cramped interior, fitted several hundred weight of additional armour, and given the whole thing a nice beige paint job. Everyone's exhausted, including Nick. I asked him what he thought of the squad's efforts. Centurion has got to be the hardest one to work on. Um, it's a nasty old bus. It's, you know, it's just everything's awkward. Yeah. I mean, we've modified this in many ways now, and it's a usable serviceable tank and I'll find all sorts of little jobs for it. Time for the final verdict from the judges. The last within this, uh, these classes by no means least and one of the heaviest, the heavy allied vehicle, an outstanding restoration. The Centurion Avery tank by Salvage Squad. <laughs>